Hello, and welcome to another instalment of The Weird Chronicles. Each episode, we bring you tales of action and adventure from Malifaux and the other side. The Swamp Hag Zoraida is notorious throughout Malifaux for her power and malevolence. Brave or foolish petitioners have been known to venture deep into the bayou, seeking her out in the hopes of acquiring a boon. Some want power, some want revenge, some even want love. But the boons that Zoraida grants are never quite what they seem. I hope you enjoy part one of The White Fist. The White Fist by Graham Stevenson The shack growled over his head. Adulio sat hunched like a man anticipating a blow, and every so often glanced at the interlaced boards above him. They moved almost imperceptibly, making the faintest of grinding sounds and giving glimpses of the night stars beyond. The movement was rhythmic, like the rickety building was breathing. It was also watching him. That much he could not deny, no matter how his rational mind scoffed at the idea. He sat on an upturned iron cauldron atop a stack of yellowed, curl-edged papers. That was the most orderly point in the explosive chaos that surrounded him. The walls were hung with bunches of dried grass, vegetables and weeds, slabs of meat from a variety of sources, not all of them immediately identifiable, and some with skin and hair still attached, twisted pieces of birch and willow threaded with tiny brilliant flowers, lizard bones, snake skins, jumbled talismans made from bird skeletons, hand-carved wooden flutes, and hundreds of coloured glass shards glued together with a doughty epoxy that reflected the shack's firelight in a thousand slices of crimson, violet, emerald, ochre and sapphire. The source of this light came from a smoky, crackling wood fire set in a pit in the centre of the shack, above which sat the largest copper vessel Adulio had ever seen. It could be argued that this thing was a cauldron, but a more dented, stained, misshapen cauldron one would have to try very hard to find. Over the cauldron and fire was a spit made from two Y-shaped U-shafts and a fire-blackened stake, impaling a cluster of small and unappetizing lizards. The heat and smoke from the blaze had curled the tiny reptiles into fists, and he couldn't make up his mind whether this was dinner for the shack's sole patron, or yet another unknowable facet of the preparation he had been witnessing. Directly across from him, and busy over the cauldron with a selection of curios on a piece of greasy vellum, was the rider, the hag. She was mumbling to herself in a preoccupied way, as those who live in comparative isolation tend to do. Into the empty yet scalding hot cauldron, she had already scraped a handful of stalks from an unknown bog plant that gave off a piercing stench the moment they touched the cauldron's hot belly. An assortment of other inscrutables were then flicked in with the tip of a curved knife, including the head of a mouse, a number of chopped and partially crushed seeds, and something that might have been either sheep wool or wadded spider thread. She then proceeded to squeeze the fluid from a plant bulb that still had clods of earth hanging from its roots. The dripping fluid hissed violently and evaporated almost instantly, giving off a cloud of sweet and pungent steam. Good. She had grinned as she leaned forward and took in the scents from the cauldron. Good, good, good. She threw the crushed bulb aside, which vanished into the drifts of clutter and detritus that covered the shack's floor space. Now the pledge, boy. The pledge. Adulio had been fingering the leather bracelet ceaselessly while the hag worked. It had been a gift from Lupita some weeks before, when she had tried to sell them at her stall. Although few people had shown interest, they were pretty things made from thin strips of animal skin pleated into simple wristbands. 
Adulio's had been her favourite, she had told him as she fixed it around his wrist, and that it would bring him luck. It hadn't strictly been a gift as such, but his heart had ached when he saw how few she had sold, and he had spent his last coin without another thought. It felt a sin to take it off now. He had worn it religiously from the day she had tied it in place. But the hag cackled when he voiced his concerns and reassured him he would have it back. Reluctantly, he slipped the bracelet off. Zoraida gripped his bare forearm with one clawed hand and took the bracelet with the other, throwing it into the cauldron. Before Adulio could protest, she drew the curved knife across the palm of his hand with a single, sure stroke. The pitted steel was much sharper than it looked, and he barely felt the sting. But within seconds a red wound yawned open, and blood poured freely into the cauldron, hissing angrily as it dripped and spattered on the hot metal. Adulio cried out in alarm, but the hag gripped his wrist with ferocious strength, her sunken eyes tight shut while she muttered. He could not make out the words, but the language sounded old and foul and somehow forbidden. Shadows began to leap and shudder across the walls as the fire guttered, spat, and then turned a terrible leprous yellow colour. The shack around them groaned desperately, and a sudden wind knifed through the slats. But still the hag held Adulio's wrist, and still she chanted. Smoke was boiling from the cauldron as his blood burned, and Adulio questioned his sanity for the hundredth time in coming to this place. Love and desperation had driven him, as had the unlikely recommendation of his friend, Pablo. Allegedly wise in the ways of the world, and a self-confessed exponent of the mysterious powers. Pablo had filled his head with stories of Zoraida and her charms and potions. Her potency was a stuff of legend, how she commanded the dark arts from her place deep within the swamplands, and that if one could find her, all manner of boons could be requested. What Pablo had failed to tell him was Zoraida was a vicious, cantankerous old monster, who could not be found unless she wanted to be, and was more inclined to watch ill-fated Lotharios being sucked beneath the black waters for her own amusement than offer any semblance of assistance. That being said, there had been a curious gleam in the hag's eye when Adulio staggered within sight of her battered, lamp-lit shack. He had been searching for hours, was smeared from head to foot in swamp filth, and had barely managed to avoid being poisoned or gored by any number of vile bog denizens. Perhaps it was his determination to find her that had won him his audience. She was not inclined to say, but she had listened to his tale of desperate and yearning love for the beautiful Lupita, and she had finally nodded when he had asked for her help. And now she was bleeding him dry into her smoking cauldron while jaundiced flames roared at their feet. He could feel his blood pulsing through his wrist and out the wound in his hand. The sensation made him nauseous. Zoraida seemed unconcerned, her gnarled fingers locked around his arm, the knife still held high, her head lowered as barely discernible words spilled from her mouth. His head was beginning to swim. Whether from the blood loss or the heat or a combination of both, he wasn't sure. There seemed to be no air in the shack, despite the howling wind outside. Every breath he took was fumes and hot copper. And then the death grip on his wrist was released, and the flames were orange once more, and Zoraida was winding a piece of white silk around his hand. He watched dumbly as crimson roses blossomed through the layers of bandage. Good she said as she yanked the dressing tight. You are strong. The bond will be strong. Adulio wiped at his perspiring forehead with his free hand. Then it is done? It is, Zoraida said. I have given you what you asked. Despite his dizziness, Adulio felt a burgeoning elation. Lupita. 
The hag reached into the billowing brown clouds of the cauldron and withdrew Lupita's bracelet. The blood and heat had shriveled the leather and turned it black, and it smelled strongly of copper and swamp as she retied it around his wrist. It was still painfully hot, but he bore the pain gladly if it meant Lupita would be his. There, she said when the band was fixed securely. Good, good. Adulio closed his hand into a fist around the silk bandage, squeezing it experimentally. The dressing was tight and secure, but the silk covering his palm was already bright red and sodden. Zoraida grinned at his expression. The price was too high, hey? She cackled. You look troubled, boy. Is she not worth it? Worth it and more he said immediately, filled with rash bluster. Were the price my whole hand, I would pay it. The swamp witch displayed her horrible teeth and her eyes glinted. You offer your hand for her love. What a beauty she must be. The eyes, all oh, the hair. She flicked at her ratty grey locks with sharp fingers in a coquettish gesture. Adulio only had eyes for the band around his wrist. I will go to her tomorrow, he said half to himself. I will tell her how I feel, and she will understand. The rider gripped his injured hand with both of hers and held it up to his face. This is the bond, she said. She is bound to you, and you to her. A price you have paid, a boon you shall have. Death awaits the man who would seek to take her from you. So speaks Sarayda. Adulio felt his heart swell with exhilaration. I will go to her tomorrow, he said again, excited thoughts beginning to jumble in his head. She will love me, and we will be together. Adulio was so enraptured with his vision of the day to come that he quite missed the look of devious cunning on the face of the hag. Had he stopped to listen more closely to her words, he may have questioned the fact that she had mentioned nothing of reciprocal affection from Lupita. Were he a more level-headed young man, he may have thought more carefully about what he had asked for and perhaps found a more subtle way to unearth Lupita's feelings for him but his overriding fear had been that she would fall for another, and he had pleaded that Zoraida ensure she would be for him and him alone. Time would prove this a tragic oversight on his part, compounded by the instinctive malice of the swamp witch, but at that moment Adulio truly believed that his prayers had been answered. The events of the following morning, however, would prove just how wrong he was. Thirty yards from the main doors to the guild offices stood Curmudgeon Square. Ask any of Malifaux's teeming residents where this title had come from, and you would be rewarded with little more than a shrug or a blank look. Ask where this square was to be found, and that shrug or blank look would always be accompanied by a pointing finger. Curmudgeon Square was one of those places with the dubious honour of being well known among the denizens of the city, without necessarily having qualified for its notoriety. The fact that it governed the crossroads of two main thoroughfares of the city, as well as its proximity to the huge and brooding guild offices and the widespread knowledge of its location, made Curmudgeon Square a popular favourite among meeting locations. The square itself was better than 200 yards across and paved in dark and almost perpetually wet granite, this expanse was studded with a multitude of statues and obelisks, many of which were so weather-worn or time-eaten that all features and detail had long since been erased. On three sides loomed monolithic buildings of academia and bureaucracy, remarkable only for their size and grey uniformity. The fourth and south-facing side of the square was open to the crossroads, two busy thoroughfares that slashed and backslashed diagonally through the city 
and sat like the crossed bones beneath the square's granite skull. Despite this dour description, the square was constantly populated by stool vendors, hawkers, jugglers and artisans of every stripe and colour, transforming the soulless expanse into a bustling hive of entrepreneurial commerce. Cries of merchants and salesmen, soothsayers and mystics, mingled with haggling customers and the laughter of children that darted through the crowds like tiny fish through rough water. All these sounds were buoyed up on air currents, scented with roasted meat and nuts, alcohol, exotic spices, and the constant sweet breeze of honeysuckle and jasmine that drifted from the flower vendors across the southernmost edge of the square. Being the only area that escaped the perpetual shadows of the towers beyond, the southern edge of Curmudgeon Square was where the flower vendors plied their trade. At first light each morning, wagons and handbarrows would rattle into position, and a vivid explosion of nature's finest would proceed to engulf the area. There were pots of mauve and turquoise bell tops, and clusters of tiny petaled jack limes. Also, vibrant and flame red bog beacons and elegant white widows were popular, the latter's characteristic ivory stems and flamboyant hanging petals were visible clear across the square. Persimmons, violets, red betties, yolandas, peach whites, rouge whites, even the melodramatic and grandiose archdrake could be found, whose seeds, when ground to an almond paste, were quite deadly, but hidden behind tremendous starburst flowers, a full sixteen inches across. Lupita sold flowers, to look at her, one would guess that had always been her purpose in life. Naturally sallow-skinned, she had the high, wide cheekbones of an Asiatic, with large, perfectly shaped onyx eyes, and hair dark as licorice. She kept it tied back, but a few strands invariably escaped and hung over her eyes, lending an endearing imperfection to an otherwise perfect face. Her fingers were long and nimble, and responsible for the smattering of little trinkets and talismans she sold in conjunction with her flowers. She was a beauty to behold, and all who did agreed her place was among the delicate beauties of her wares. Sadly, such beauty brings attention, and often unwelcome at that. There were any number of ill-suited bows that had made their attentions known to her, most of whom flitted from girl to girl, much like the insects that frequented her stool, sampling whichever nectar was on offer. Mostly harmless, she would laugh dutifully at their flattery. They would buy a flower to present to her. She would pocket the coin and put the flower back on display the moment they had moved on. It was only a tiny dishonesty, and besides, there seemed little value in presenting a flower seller with one of her own stock as a token of esteem. There were more dangerous visitors to her stool than insects, however. Being so close to the guild offices meant that a constant traffic of bureaucrats and guild officials passed through the square, any number of them corpulent, vain and powerful. This was a difficult combination to resist at the best of times, and one or two were more persistent than most. The worst by far was Ermine Follop. Short and stooped and balding, and undoubtedly all the more venomous for it, Follop had taken a particular shine to Lupita, and would make a point of visiting her stool each morning. He never bought anything, despite having more than enough coin. No, he sought something that, while on display, was not for sale. He would take every opportunity to pour at her, holding her hand, offering to brush hair from her eyes, inquiring after her like a kindly uncle. But all the time... His rapacious eyes would crawl over her, and his pink tongue would move ceaselessly over his teeth and lips. He was a wretched and repellent man, but occupied a position of great influence within the guild, and had a reputation for exploiting it. And then there was Adulio. Handsome, stumbling, mumbling Adulio. Like a boy trapped in a man's body, he had a strong jaw and broad shoulders, but had not the nerve to meet her eye and blushed dramatically every time he came to her stool. He was endearingly loyal, having been the first to buy a wristband from her when she tentatively began to make trinkets to supplement her flower sales. But he was still half a child in her eyes, 
perhaps in a few years when he had found his confidence. She smiled at the thought and dismissed it. She could never imagine Adulio being anything other than exactly how he was. The most beautiful flower in the whole square, said a voice at her shoulder. And how is my beautiful flower this morning? Follop stood inches from her, his eyes flicking across the hollow of her throat. Were a cold leech to have crawled into her ear, she couldn't have been more repelled. Good morning to you, sir. She acknowledged his arrival with a pained smile. The creepy little man insisted on taking her hand and kissing it with his sticky lips. His fingernails were long and yellow, and she couldn't avoid staring at his bald pate while he bowed. It looked like an egg fringed in ratty animal pelt. You are growing more delicious with every passing day, commented Follop, his eyes crinkling above what he would probably have described as a smile, blossoming into a woman before my very eyes. It does my soul good to see you each morning. Lupita doubted that he had one, but answered, Kind word, sir. Would you care to make a purchase this morning? Pale imitations, he said dismissively, gesturing towards her stock. No stem nor petal can compare to the beauty that stands here before me. You have a way with words, sir, but words alone cannot fuel my hearth or fill my stomach. Is there nothing here that might brighten your office? Some silver smock, perhaps? Or a lily on the water? Follop stepped closer, in what was undoubtedly a confidential gesture, but only served to bring her into the radius of his body odour. I understand your concern, sweetling. Times are hard for all concerned, least of all a street vendor. My heart grows heavy at the thought of your beauty standing here, day after day in vain, ultimately wilting like your displays. I make a living, sir, from those that wish to buy. His tongue squirmed across his lips like a shaved weasel. Being an employee of the Guild, I am considered an influential man in some circles, and not without finances. I could ensure that you were well looked after. I could see to it that you could put all this behind you and live a life of comparative luxury. Those delicate hands need never feel the sting of another thorn. A generous officer, but I am content with my lot. Follop chuckled, ignorant to Lupita's growing discomfort. My dear, there is no need to be so humble. Beauty deserves to be treated with favour and delicacy, and you are uncommonly beautiful. Again, sir. You flatter me, but I have a business to tend. She glanced about in the hope of snaring another customer with which to excuse herself, but the stand was frustratingly empty. Follop made a show of plucking a brilliant purple moonshade and twirling it in his hand. Might I suggest that this is an opportunity you should not brush aside so lightly, he said, examining the trumpet-shaped flower. Have you no desire to wear the finest silks, nor dine in the most opulent restaurants of the city? I would see to it that you were the jewel in the crown of Malifaux society. I am a flower girl, sir. I could never be a part of such grandeur. If you are content with less, then so much the better. Whatever you could wish, I can provide he said. Lupita had inched back as much as she dared, struggling to find a way to extricate herself from this conversation without offending the foul little man. I fear the price for such luxury would be too high, she said, then quickly added, besides, I am my own woman and have the freedom to do as I will. Why would I give that up? 
Follop raised the moonshade to his lips and brushed them lightly. Come, my dear, you resist so strongly, but we both know that my offer is more than generous. Surely I am not that unappealing. Lupita heard a muffled zip, and then Follop's expression contorted with surprise and pain. He twitched back like a man stung, which was exactly what he was, and clapped a hand to his face. The moonshade was thrown from him convulsively, and Lupita watched a yellow jacket hornet spiral lazily from the depths of the flower and take to the morning air. The little man howled in pain, clutching at his rapidly swelling nose, and it was then that Lupita did a foolish thing. She giggled. Follop's face flushed crimson with humiliation and rage. Amused, are we? He snarled, still gripping his injured nose. You'll rue the day you rejected me, you willful little bitch. Before this day is out, I'll knock you off that haughty pedestal. Just you wait. Flustered and boiling with anger, he spun on his heel and barged away across the square, knocking over several clay pots and spilling their contents. Lupita watched him go with growing trepidation. It was an hour or so later when Adulio pushed his way along the busy thoroughfare to Curmudgeon Square. He had spent some considerable time washing off the slime and muck of the marshlands and choosing an outfit in which to meet Lupita. His hair was slicked back with pomade, and he had a fresh daisy in the buttonhole of his best suit. Upon removing the silk bandage, he discovered to his surprise that there was no evidence of Zoraida's cut to his palm. The skin was smooth and unbroken. Trusting this as further evidence of her power, he fingered the band on his wrist one last time and set off to meet his true love. He knew something was wrong the moment he reached the square. Lupita's flower stool had been knocked over onto its back and her wares were scattered everywhere. A crowd of concerned-looking vendors stood around it, talking animatedly and stealing frequent glances across the square towards the guild offices. What happened? he asked as soon as he got within arm's length of the gathering. One hoary old woman he recognised as another of the flower sellers turned and gave him a wide-eyed stare. She's gone. Taken? Taken? Adulio didn't understand. Taken where? By who? Guild thugs, the woman said, hawking a green wad of protest onto the slabs. A handful of them. Come out of their rat's nest up north of the square. Said they was arresting her for assault of a guild officer. Kicked her stool over and dragged her away, they did. What? Adulio looked down at the wreckage of Lupita's stool. The flowers underfoot had been crushed, and here and there were woven bracelets among the dead plants. The band around his wrist burned. That little weasel, the old woman said, pointing a crooked finger. He's to blame for this. Plain enough knowledge he had designs on her. Only the girl's got more sense. Appears he didn't get the answer he wanted. Poor girl, to come to this. Adulio set his teeth, his fists clenched. Weasel. What weasel? Him what's been sniffing around her like a dog. The old woman snarled. Works up at the guild. Some fancy lord or mind your business or other. Follop his name is. Ermin Follop. That's it for another episode of The Weird Chronicles. Join us next time for the conclusion of The White Fist.